Isaiah chapter 53. Now, in Isaiah 53, verse 7, Isaiah here was given some, some insight about Jesus Christ and what he was going to have to go through. And he says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It says in verse number 8, By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. Now it says in the, in the book that today's point is that the Bible is true and it helps us tell others about Jesus. So since the Bible is true, we can always count on it to be the, the foundation of our faith, the solid rock that is unwavering. We can build upon that not only with the beginning knowledge of salvation but who Jesus is and we can look back in the Old Testament and see... Um, how God was letting his people know he's coming and he's going to suffer for you. He's going to suffer in place of you. He's going to go through these things, but he's going to do it with such humility and grace. He's not going to say a word. It's not going to be like we would be if we were being uh, having our flesh stripped from our body or being punished for our sins or, or just getting whipped. We would be crying out in pain and, and for mercy, and Jesus didn't say a word. And what the Bible is talking about here is not just the fact that he was able to stay quiet. It was his willingness to do it. He didn't protest. He was willing to, to take our sin and to take our punishment for it. It says that he was oppressed and afflicted, but he didn't open his mouth. He willingly, openly did that. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Who of this generation protested? Who was crying out for Jesus to be freed? Instead, they cried out for, uh, for Barabbas to be freed. No one was on his behalf. And he said he was cut off from the land of the living. He was killed. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. For the sins of God's people, which is all of creation, he was punished. Now this scripture right here is, we're going to discuss it in just a minute in, in the book of Acts chapter 8, but there was a guy from the southern Nile region around Ethiopia. He was... Uh, uh, a, a eunuch for the, the Ethiopian queen, and he had traveled to Jerusalem because he wanted some information about God. Y'all know God's Holy Spirit, He called you, right? He called you to salvation. He called you because you were living in sin, you were, you were dead in your trespasses, you were dead in sin, and God called you to salvation. First thing He did was to convict you of your sin. His Holy Spirit convicted you and let you know that something is wrong. And you, at that point, started to make a choice whether I'm going to listen to this voice or not. God's Holy Spirit called you to salvation. And that's why when you started hearing about Jesus and you heard about that forgiveness that He offers, it made sense. It was something that you wanted and you craved. And it's like, I believe. And that's where salvation started. Well, this guy had already heard about some of it. He wanted some more information, so he went up to Jerusalem. I guess that's why it's the Jerusalem marketplace. So he came up to Jerusalem, and he was uh, looking for some more information. And he had obtained a, a parchment of Scripture. And on that Scripture was the, this passage out of Isaiah. And it's like, okay, he was, he was punished for me, but he didn't say a word. He was placed with the, the dead, but he didn't say a word. He was punished for the, for the sins of the people, but his people, nobody cried out for him. Who is this that he's talking about? What is, what's this story about? Who is this? He had some questions. He went to Jerusalem, like the capital of, of religion, but he didn't get his answers. 
Well, God called as He often does. He called His speaker. We're in the book of Acts chapter 8. We find this story. We're going to start in verse number 26. Acts 8, 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near. Y'all, I'm going to be frank with you. In that time, it wasn't so much racism that kept people apart. It was just being different. When Jesus went to the woman at the well, she said, why are you a Jew talking to me a Samaritan? A Samaritan. These folks looked the same. They were from the same region. They just were of a different family, all right, different towns. So they didn't associate with one another. Now, this Ethiopian guy from the South Nile region, you know, he was uh, a darker-skinned individual. And Philip being a Jewish man, he was an olive-skinned individual, but they were definitely different looking. They were also different uh, believing, different backgrounds, a lot of differences. And y'all, in those days, a lot more so than now, when you had a difference, it kept you divided. You just didn't associate with people that were different from you. You didn't talk to them, you didn't, you didn't uh, you know, entertain them, and it was just, it, that's just the way it was. But when Jesus came along, he changed it all. Because Jesus did not come here to serve a people or a color or someone from a city or a nation. He came for all people. And he came to unite all people. While dividing people into two groups, lost and saved, all right, the ones that chose God and the ones that chose against God, he divided them in that way. And that was the only way that people should ever be divided against. Now, in our VBS is coming up, we're going to have some kids that, that might uh, look different, smell different, act different. Um, they might be different. They might talk different. But we should in no way love anyone any less than we would our own children, you know. But I love the way that Philip was obedient to the Holy Spirit's call. You know, we have a bunch of teachers that have answered the call to teach during VBS. And there is a lot of preparation that goes into it. Um, those of you working in the kitchen, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. Not just ahead of time, but that night also. There's a, a tremendous act of service that everybody working together can make a, a vacation Bible school possible. Um, it it was very painful last year to not have vacation Bible school. Not just because of the traditional aspect of it, but the, the lack of the evangelism. Um, I mean, just having church closed for so long and then not having stuff, it was just, it really made you appreciate it. Um, so this year, more than any, I think, that we should be able to look at every child as though um, we were Philip. It's like, wow, I, I cannot wait to tell you about what I know. I cannot wait to serve you. I cannot wait to, to let you know about this truth that is unchanged and has never changed and it's going to be forever and ever and ever. I can't wait to teach that. And these kids, there's a lot of them that they missed not getting to come last year to VBS. They didn't a lot of them go to several VBSs, and they didn't have any. And it was like, I didn't get to go to none. Like, well, we got a brand new one just waiting to be rolled out. Here we go. And I love that the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, we know what a verb is, right? A verb is a word that denotes action. In the very next verse, what is the verb? 
So Philip moseyed up to the chariot. No. He ran, didn't he? The Holy Spirit told him to go to that chariot and then stay near it. And it says that he ran to it. He could not wait to tell. He couldn't wait. And when you have that type of excitement, that type of enthusiasm, it rubs off. It is like you are in a revived state and it rubs off on everybody around you. This eunuch had no idea what was about to hit him. He had done went to Jerusalem to find answers. He had done went to church looking for an answer. This parchment, he was sitting there on the side of the road reading it, reading the book of Isaiah, wondering, who is this about? And here comes this joker running up beside him, running up to him. Man, you know, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Holy Spirit told me to come talk to you. He's like, Holy Spirit? Who is Holy Spirit? Because that's my Ethiopian accent. And, and it's the one I serve. It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I do not know this Jesus. But I would like to know, who is this Jesus you're speaking of? I only have Isaiah. I'm reading Isaiah. But they're talking about someone who was slaughtered and didn't say a word. Who is he talking about? <laughs> Give me a second. I shouldn't have ran. I could have talked more quicker, sooner if I hadn't ran, but I ran. I was just so excited. So he gets up there, and Philip asks him, he says, I see you're reading Isaiah. Do you, do you understand what you're reading? He says, How can I? Unless somebody, I cannot, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip, Come up here and sit with me. Come sit. Sit right here. Explain, please. So, like he turned into Borat for a minute. So, verse 32, he says, it says, this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice, which means nobody spoke up for him. That's what Isaiah said. Um, who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So he didn't have any uh, descendants like children and, and stuff because his life was taken. So um, his life was taken from the earth and, and therefore he was dead. So the eunuch asked Philip, he says, uh, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or somebody else? So he didn't know if it was Isaiah talking about Isaiah or if he was talking about somebody else, he didn't understand. Because a lot of times, when you are given a Bible, and you, you might pick it up out of a, a hotel drawer, or just find one, or Gideon gives you a little one at school or something like that, and you open it up and you start reading it, some of it is, is literal. Some of it you can take literally, and it's pretty easy to understand, but some of it, you have no idea what it's talking about. Because the Holy Spirit reveals these mysteries. And that's the beautiful thing about um, Vacation Bible School is that through all of the songs, they were prayerfully written and choreographed so that the kids could remember something about Christ. All of the lessons are, are worked together with that. Every single craft or, or mission lesson, everything is working together to build upon that knowledge and to hopefully unravel the mystery of that particular lesson. This guy was hungry, but he didn't understand. I think the greatest thing that Philip was bringing with him was not just knowledge about Isaiah, but it was the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, He can do anything that He wants. And man, I love what He did here. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is He talking about? Himself or somebody else? And Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told the good news about Jesus. If somebody asked you, why do you have hope? What is grace? What is the mercy of God? You know, How could I possibly not be freaked out right now because I feel like I don't see how things can work out. I don't see how things can get any better. And we start telling them the good news of Jesus about the grace of God, about 
the forgiveness of God, the eternal life He gives, and the hope that that brings with it, and how He will give us a peace that passes all understanding, and He will never leave us. You'll never be alone, and He'll be with us to the very end of the age. And when is that going to be? It's never going to happen. He's always going to be with us, and we get to live forever. You know, and it's so hard to grasp and to put it into words what that means, eternal life. You're not going to die. Your soul, the part of you that's thinking, it's not just a gray blob of goo in your noggin. That's not just, it's not just a, a, a it's a soul. It's an eternal thing, okay? I mean, y'all look at us. We are carbon-based life forms, okay? We, we come from the dust and we're going to return to the dust, our bodies. But our bodies are different from any other living thing on this earth. Because they have a soul in them. And our soul is eternal. It's going to live forever. All these little kids has got souls. All of us have souls. And our soul is going to live on either in heaven, living, or in hell, dying. But it's going to live. When our bodies give up, we're just going to go somewhere else. Our soul is going to be set free. and We're going to go to be with God if we believe in Him. And that is the greatest news you can tell. That is the good news. How do I, how do I make sure that I'm going to heaven? Well, I, I'm glad you asked. I would like to tell you about Jesus Christ. God demands that the, the payment for sin is death. And Jesus came down here and paid it for you. Now, if you would just believe in Him, accept Him, and let Him be the Lord of your life, let Him be your Savior, you gain eternal life. You're born again at that moment. You... You are living your second life, one that's never going to end. When you your body passes away, no matter what happens to you, you're going to go on living with Jesus. And don't you want to don't you want to make sure of that right now today? You know this guy he was he was curious. He wanted some answers. He went to church looking for him, and God sought him out and found him on the side of the road. It says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? If you be Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So Philip basically gave him the invitation right there. He said, if you believe with all your heart, now this word believe is the same belief found in John 3.16 and other places in the Bible. In the Greek, that word means surrender. If you surrender your life. Like, I cannot earn my salvation. There's nothing that I can do that's going to impress God enough to just let me have eternal life. Jesus did everything that was necessary and God won't accept anything else. So do you accept it or not? Do you... Do you make an acknowledgement that you need to be saved, then let Him save you. I can't, I can't get salvation on my own. I can't earn it. I can't work it. I don't deserve it. Jesus gave it. And I want to give my life to Him. You can't withhold. You can't like halfway be saved. It's all or nothing. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. It's one or the other. I mean, you cannot have the Holy Spirit living in you and, and have a, a sinful nature ruling you at the same time. It, it does not work that way. So, if you have a, a sinful nature ruling your life where you are living without remorse, when something creeps up, when you think about something, you say something or you do something, you don't have any remorse over that, then the Holy Spirit's not living in you. You've never surrendered. And that's a real, real problem for a lot of folks. Not just these kids of EBS, y'all, but people in our church, people in our community, people in our family. If they died today, where would they go? This eunuch, he come face to face with that. He said, there's some water. 
What can stand in the way of me being saved? Philip said, do you, you believe with all your heart? He said, I do. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. I don't know if he flew. I don't know if he disappeared. I don't know if he, he led him. I mean, he did ran. Or he did run. You know. He did ran away. He ran up there. He might have ran away fast, you know. Uh, Philip might have been like the Usain Bolt of the apostles, you know. I mean, he might have been there at the tomb and nobody saw him. I mean, John, y'all listen, John was writing it. John was like, and the disciple whom Jesus loved outran Peter. Right? I mean, you know, that's what I would write too. The disciple whom Jesus loved the most outran him. <laughs> but then he got scared and didn't go in and he let the old man go first. <laughs> Never mind. You wouldn't mention if Philip outran you, would you? But Philip, faster than the one that Jesus loved, outran both of us and then left again real fast to go to, you know, the road south of Jerusalem. But anyway, I, I don't think he was there. Anyway, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away, and the unit did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Do you remember? what it felt like when you were saved, when you didn't, you didn't have to worry about going to hell anymore. Do you remember that? Do you remember that it was, it was freeing, you know? It was, it was like, ah, oh, all right. So I've been running from this for a while, and, and now it's settled, and it's, it's nice. You know, little young'uns probably ain't going to have this, this overwhelming sense of guilt over their sin. Um, usually when they get to be around 7 to 10 years old, they start realizing what sin is. And there for a couple of years, they're, they're very pliable where their hearts are soft enough that they are receptive to the Holy Spirit. And then they turn into teenagers and they think they know everything. So it's going to take a minute. But they are, you know, in, in, that, in that age where... Um, they're probably not going to be broken hearted over their sin because they haven't had a tremendously sinful life yet, but they are still receptive to the Holy Spirit working. And when they hear about Jesus, that's why he speaks about the faith of a child. It's so innocent. It's like, I would like to live forever with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, well, why wouldn't we do that? Why not be saved, you know? And... They don't overcomplicate it. So it's almost a lot easier to share the gospel with the little ones because, you know, they're not, they're just not that cynical yet. When they get older, they become cynical and, and very, very doubtful. It's like, well, if God is so good, then why, why am I depressed all the time? Why do I have to get up in the morning and go to school if God is so good. You know, and just stuff like that. It's 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 not a real good argument, but y'all know we all had them. It was just ridiculous. So this guy. This guy. He went away rejoicing. He went back to his his place, his spot. And uh I imagine, like with the Samaritan woman leaving the well and said her whole city uh, came to know the Lord. I can imagine that there was a big revival break out where he was. And y'all, that is really the point of VBS, is to share the good news and the good news go home with the kids. And, and the parents come in and they see their macaroni crafts and they eat their ice cream and hopefully they're like, that satisfied my stomach and my soul. I would like some more, please. And 
you know, because y'all, we're Southerners. We love seconds and thirds, right? So hopefully they'd be so filled that first night that they're like, that was, that was pretty nice. I would like some more, please. And then they'd come back for some more. And then pretty soon they're like, hey, can I feed somebody this stuff? Because I like it so much, maybe I can share with somebody else. Well, yes, you can. You can share it with, with your family and with your friends and neighbors. And then pretty soon we got a, we got a whole pyramid scheme going, you know? Well, it's not a scheme. It's, it's just evangelism. You tell, and you tell in all of your class, you'll have, say, 10, and then those 10 go back to their families, and that 10 is, is now spread to 40, and then that 40 is, is spread, and, you know, pretty soon it's, it's everywhere. Oh, man. One guy changed the world. And he did it without arguing at all. And we get to talk about it. You seek me and you find me when you search with your whole heart. You search with all your heart and you find me. And that's what Jeremiah was saying about Jesus. Y'all got any questions, any concerns, or anything about VBS?